Hi, everyone. The clock is ticking. Um, I have to be kind of fast. Yesterday night was um, fun. <laughs> you will maybe see it today on me. Um, so thank uh, organizers for organizing such a great party. Uh, anyway, today um, I decided not to have a presentation. I have a lot of things to, to tell you and to share with you and to discuss, actually. So I, I want to make this kind of almost half interactive with the audience. Um, I will talk about NFTs beyond collections. And probably you know that the NFT term recently uh, had a big hype. That's why we're all here. This is the conference that is about NFTs. Uh, but I want to ask you, like in the audience, how many of you hold an NFT in your wallet? Can we raise hands? OK, not much. Maybe, maybe you can buy some. I mean, the ones that don't own it. Um, so anyway, the, the question here is, do you really own it? That's the question. Like, what is the NFT that you own? Do you know how it fits in your wallet? Do you actually know how the metadata is stored inside of the NFT? Uh, the problems that we are facing today with the NFTs is that actually we don't know what we own and what we don't own. It's a hash in a blockchain. That's what you own. And the metadata of the NFT is actually stored on a decentralized or sometimes even centralized storage. That means that the thing that you think you own, the image, is actually a link that is propagated in a file that is also stored in a storage that is sometimes not even decentralized, which means that you don't own it. Because you can, of course, <laughs> right-click, save as, and then you have another one. So the, the question here is, like, what are NFTs for? And when I give uh, public lectures, I usually say that the biggest problem of the NFTs is that they don't solve any problems. And that is true right now. Maybe we can have two different cases now to start with this, this discussion. Like The first case is, yes, it solves a thing, which is digital art. Okay, in a digital art sphere, the problem that digital art has had in the recent couple of years is that, not recent couple of years, maybe last 20 years, is that their, their work was not appreciated. They could not value the uh, digital art work because you could just save as, right? And, and then send a, a link or, or image in an email. So now, finally, with the NFTs, we can say, OK, you own this JPEG file or a PNG file or a 3D file, which is not quite right, but still it, it brought valuation and value to the NFTs. The second thing that happened in the last year, and you've probably seen a lot of it, is that the NFTs were used as a funding mechanism. So that's kind of a problem that it solved, is how to raise money through putting out a collection of, I don't know, let's say 10,000 pieces or 5,000 pieces. And that's actually a funding scheme. It's not, uh, uh, hey, here are the NFTs that solve certain problems. So what pro projects used to do is kind of think about methodologies of what NFTs could bring to their audiences and then create collections in order to actually raise funding. And raising funding is something that has been uh, going on in a civilization for quite a while. But the thing is that, you know, you had a couple of different options to raise funding, right? You're selling equity. In the company, in the crypto space, you were selling tokens. Um, in, crowd, in crowdfunding space, you were selling some, some future products. But in the NFT space, people came up with this fantastic idea to put, you know, on, on 10,000 JPEGs, to put some rarity scores, to put some special things in these NFTs so that they make them unique. And then they sell that uh, a whole bunch of NFTs in front promising that you know, the, the, the future utility will come. So there's a lot of regulatory problems associated with raising money with the NFTs, and especially with making promises about future utility of NFTs. And now I ask you, like, what, is the, what is the utility of the NFT? What the NFT is used for? OK, this is valuation of the art. On the other hand side, it's a kind of raising money for, for a, a, a project. But can we actually use the NFT somewhere? Now, here comes the, the question of NFTs beyond collections. There are a lot of things that NFTs could do for us, but they are simply not yet there. We are not there at the position that we can say, OK, NFTs could be used for tickets. NFTs could be used for um, real estate. NFTs could be used for music. And I'll tell you why. There is an example 
that, that happened uh, uh, recently in, in SoulSea Marketplace. And that, that was really crazy. Like, there were some rogue sharks collection, okay, some 3D sharks. So the guy put out on, on their website, I mean, the guy, the, the, the team, said they, they're giving away all their intellectual property rights to the holders of this shark when, when they buy it. And you know what happened? People started minting because the uh, SoulSea is an open marketplace, which means that anyone can come and mint any NFT. People started minting uh, copies of sharks. And then the community was yelling like, hey, you have fake sharks on, on SoulSea. You need to take them down. And we are like, how do you know it's a fake shark? If the shark authors gave away all their IP rights in a statement on their website, does that mean that the new owner of the new shark can actually copy the shark and mint the same shark as a copy with the full rights to do that and then resell that as a copy? Of course he can, because the original author gave away all the IP rights. So that, that was a huge problem for us and, of course, for the community, but no one would listen. No one would say, ah, that was the problem. Like, we cannot give away all the IP rights for a, you know, a JPEG image because then new owners can mint indefinitely uh, uh, sharks. And then there's another example. Recently, like a couple of days ago, uh, there was a, a TV commercial for a mobile provider in some country. Let's not name the country, not name the mobile provider. And the guys that did the, the video uh, actually accidentally used an NFT which was modified slightly uh, in, in the video commercial. And there was a big problem on Twitter about that. <clears throat> and they were asking like, hey, is this uh, IP infringement rights, whatever. But when you go to the website of the original creators, they are giving away certain types of rights in their, of course, statement, saying like, you can use this for this, you can use that for that, but there is no clear guidelines on what an owner of the NFT can actually do. And if you own the NFT, can you actually use it somewhere? Which means, for example, put it on a commercial, uh, print it on a T-shirt, whatever. Uh, so it's still an ongoing issue. But the question here is, if we are going to sell something as an NFT, do we need to put license agreements inside of the NFTs so that the, the buyer and the seller both know what they're actually buying and what they are selling? Of course, yes. But let me give you then an, another example. Music, okay, so we want to make a, a, a music uh, NFT. And then we want to put this music NFT so that people can buy this, this uh, uh, music video, for example. Now the question is, what type of license are we putting together with the NFT? Like, can I buy an NFT and then put it in my movie as the main theme? Or can I buy this NFT and then, I don't know, play it on a party? Or can I buy this NFT and use it uh, in my home. Nothing of this is solved yet. So we don't have a solution that can tell us like, okay, here is a music score, and then you have like a couple of different license rights associated to the same NFT that give the holders different type of rights, and you can read it in a blockchain. That's important because the dApps that are using these NFTs should be able to read these things from the blockchain in order to provide the ability for users to actually uh, get the appropriate license for that. So we are not yet there. Then, of course, movies. Then, uh, I mean, you name it, uh, the, it it's all, all, uh, all the problems are there at the same time for every vertical that you think of. So if we think about NFTs beyond collections, <clears throat> beyond these funding mechanisms that are currently used, we can definitely say that we need to build the infrastructure that will hold the next level of NFTs um, usable by larger communities. And when we say communities, there is an interesting thing. Uh, you heard the, uh, the lecture about DAOs, I think, previous to, to, to this one. So what happened also is a lot of experiments. Okay, so NFTs, in a way, could be used as an access right to enter a certain type of communities. So this changed the game a lot. Like you buy the NFT in order to have the privilege to enter the communication with other, other uh, community members. So that created this DAO movement where actually the community is based on the ownership of the NFT voting or participating in a specific type of action. 
Can it be solved without the NFTs? Of course it can. It's, it's not a question at all. But it's just a, showing you that people are trying to find ways to actually use the NFTs for something that is you know, unsolvable, but, but actually solvable. So why the community development is crucial point of the NFT uh, uh, movement, let's say. The NFT movement is something that we haven't experienced so far. At least I haven't seen it uh, uh, online for a while. On Solsea, once we launched Solsea, that was in uh, September last year, we thought that people will come to Solsea, mint their NFTs on Solana blockchain, and then sell them as basically one-on-one -on -one NFTs. What happened is that at the same time, um, people from, from Solana and, and Metaplex launched this candy machine thing. So candy machine was putting out 10,000 pieces like in a day, like minting these, these collections. So everybody went wild with the NFTs. And there were like 10,000 pieces of this monkey, 10,000 pieces of this cat, 10,000 pieces of, of, of this llama, you know, pixelated llamas, pixelated cats, pixelated dogs, monkeys. Um, so we ended up today, we ended up with some, I think, 15 or 16 million NFTs uh, minted on Solana blockchain right now, while we totally forgot about the value of the creator itself and the way that he can engage with his communities minting one-on-one -on -one NFTs. So this will probably change in a, in a very near future. As you know, you know the, the, the blockchain is, is uh, uh, currently under, I mean, the whole concept is, is pretty in the bear market right now, and you know, tokens are falling down in value. Everybody is scared. Of course, they should be scared. It will last for another two years. I mean, the state like this, but we will see. So anyway, the people were, were uh, experimenting with these collections and these NFTs much, uh, they went further than just minting a single, single NFT as an art piece or as, as a, let's say, a, a piece of digital value. And from these experiments, in a very short period of time, we are talking about six to eight months, there were tremendous amount of, of, of projects and experiments that were trying to use these NFTs for something that is not only like, hey, here is 10,000 pieces of collection, now you can do something with this. Tokens of collections were launched. Staking of tokens on collections were launched. Uh, new types of economies, new types of communities. And it, it kind of, it was clear that the whole NFT movement was actually based on, on building your own community around your project. And I think this is the most important um, value that, that Web3 brought to us, is that people are now engaging together into this space to hype, to uh, FOMO, to uh, FUD, uh, all of these um, kind of interesting stories that connect these uh, uh, community members and collections together. And we can see that from these communities, probably there will be more innovation and more interesting things on the usage of NFTs before the NFTs actually get to a stage that they're usable by, you know, dApps in a different way. This is what I was talking about. Music, <clears throat> movies, and, and things like that are making the, that type of, of um, next, I, I would say, next wave of, of NFT usage. <clears throat> but here <clears throat> is an interesting also, also fact. When you, when you look at the, the, the NFT uh, uh, reasons for existence of NFTs, one of the use cases that is, that is kind of put out in front in, in, the, in the front lines of, of the, the NFT talks about how they're going to change the world is gaming, <clears throat> okay? Owning your asset is something that people are saying NFTs will, will uh, uh, solve for us. So owning an asset that is inside of the game and taking it in your wallet with you from game to game or from metaverse to metaverse is something that people are very excited about and I'm excited about too. And why is this so important? As you know, gated communities, what they're called, for example, you have a Facebook, you need to have a Facebook account on Facebook in order to participate in the Facebook ecosystem. And then everything you upload on Facebook is actually owned by Facebook. So you're giving them rights of ownership based on everything that you upload there. Same goes for Instagram, same goes for basically every uh, uh, Web2 app that, that you're using. In the Web3 world, 
we will own our assets, and we are now owning our assets. The only problem is that we don't know how to use them, but that's another story. So the thing here is that if you think about it, gaming assets, the things that you earn inside of the game or you buy for a game, if you own that asset, then no one can stop you from, um, let's say, selling that asset or, or blocking you from having that asset. Because this is what gaming companies today can do. Like, they can close down your account, and then, you know, uh, uh, sometimes years of, of development of your character, gathering your items, everything is gone. But in case you hold it in your own wallet as an NFT, that means that they cannot do that. So I'm really excited about this next generation, this next leap uh, in the NFT sector that will, I mean, it will happen maybe during this year, maybe next year. And, and we, are, we are very happy to actually build that, that type of, of uh, uh, support. And for example, I, I presume that, that some of you were on, on our lecture uh, uh, yesterday, not a lecture, a panel, and you saw that we were <clears throat> represented as, as 3D avatars. So I was moving my hands, I was, uh, uh, um, I was dressed in a, in a T-shirt, and uh, actually in a shirt. And what is here interesting is that these shirts <clears throat> and these 3D avatars, they exist on our servers right now. And you can download them and you can use them, but they are not decentralized. So what is coming next is that we actually put these avatars, these shirts, these hairs, these glasses, on the blockchain as what we call 3D NFTs. Which means that once you get your avatar, you will be able to access your 3D file beyond the app that originally kind of distributed uh, uh, your avatar. And once we have this, we will be able to go with our own avatar from metaverse to metaverse with our own identity that is represented as, as our avatar. And that is the moment, I think, that the NFTs will move beyond, like, hey, let's make uh, 10,000 pieces of PFPs and then you know, uh, um, distribute that to the audience. Because these digital assets will be used in games, metaverses, exhibitions. Uh, you know, if you want to buy, um, I don't know, a chair, and then you want to put it in your metaverse, you will actually go to a marketplace and buy an NFT. You will not buy a 3D model. You will buy an NFT that then a metaverse can use that you own in your wallet. So I'm really happy that, that things are moving in this direction, but I can tell you that it's not going to happen like, like easily because the standards, the way that people are, um, let's say, fighting for dominance in the space is something that is holding us back because everybody wants their standard to be the dominant standard. We are no different, but <laughs> um, the thing here is that, yes, we do need to collaborate on this. So we need to think about how other apps can use assets from other apps so that everything can be interlinked together, because then the digital ownership makes sense. If one platform is only distributing assets for itself and then creating a community around its platform, then we don't have Web3. We don't have that leap that, that we are all expecting to happen, and that's why we are here, actually, because we, we, we see that something will, will big will happen with the NFTs. We don't know yet exactly what. But to get back on a topic of, of actually what is happening in the NFT sector, um, you know, we are behind the curtains. We run a marketplace. So that means that we know exactly what is going on when, when people want to try to buy and sell, you know, when people are applying for verification and things like that. So there is a huge amount of problems to be solved for these communities that are engaging in the NFT sector. And what is happening behind the curtains is actually some very nasty things. So don't be fooled to think about, you know, all um, yellow roses, yellow roses, yeah, the flowers and roses uh, uh, th that exist in the, in the NFT space. It's not true, right? You have to be very careful in uh, seeing what project is doing what, like how the community is building, why the price of the NFT collection is, is rising. Is the team doxed, <laughs> which means, like, can you see their faces? Are they revealed who they are, what they do? And once you understand that the space currently is populated 
with all of these players that are sometimes very, what we say, malicious, uh, uh, you will understand that we are actually not, right now, we are not in a moment that the NFTs are doing good for the humankind. We still need to, to jump there and to start utilizing NFTs for solving of some real problems, not selling 10,000 copies of, of, of you know, collections. And when I say this, um, when I say malicious, of course, it's, it, that doesn't mean that, that every, every player on the, on, the, on the market in the NFT space has bad intentions. It just means that there is a huge amount of people that are utilizing um, lack of knowledge and lack of involvement of new customers that are coming into the space to basically extract their, their money, <laughs> their values, and, and, and put it in their own pockets. But here's another interesting fact. <clears throat> We have 15 million minted NFTs on Solana, let's say. <clears throat> I think that around 14 million of these, or maybe 14 million 500,000, something like that, a crazy number, is literally their value is zero. There is no liquidity. No one is buying and selling these NFTs. No one is using these NFTs. So basically, it is what we call rug pulls. These are all soft rugs, or sometimes uh, even hard rugs happen which means that uh, you know, like, uh, uh, people just uh, <laughs> changed their Twitter profile, deleted their Twitter profiles, deleted their Discord chats, and, and removed these NFTs. So the question is, what will happen with all of these, like 99% of NFTs that were minted so far that are not digital art, but actually represent these collections in the years to come? And will they be like uh, you know, uh, tokens that were released in 2018, that most of them died? Probably yes. Are there good examples of what NFTs can be, bring for the future? No, they're not. So these are all experiments, and these are all our, um, let's say, OK, th there is a, a lot of intention to bring some value to the table. But what is actually happening behind the curtains is uh, you know, like th there is a lot, of, a lot of greed in the market. Everybody wants to earn money on the NFTs. So we need to move the whole space. And if you're a builder in the space, I urge you to focus not on flipping the NFTs, creating a next collection so that you can raise, uh, I don't know, half a million or, or a million or, or a couple of hundreds of thousands, because you would need to work on that community later on so you don't get into the trouble. So I urge you to build use cases of the future for these NFTs. Whether it's going to be you know, a, a music type of NFTs, solving the license agreements, solving the ways that, that NFTs can really be used in the future for something that, is, that, that has the real value, but not focusing only and solely on, on, on just using NFTs as, as a funding mechanism. So to kind of slowly come to a conclusion here is that if we have a 3D file that we own, if we have a digital art that we own, if we have a ticket for a concert that we own that is represented as NFT, then there are other ways to utilize these tickets than, or, or, or 3D objects than solely in one app. We should think about cross-promoting things. We should think about ways that NFTs can be utilized in real world instead of utilizing them only online. And this is what we are doing actually with, with the Exit Festival, uh, uh, with some of the drops that, that we are preparing together with them, that will give you real world utilities, like going to VIP parties, meeting the performers, uh, um, taking, you know, uh, uh, going to the festival itself, uh, taking this as, as memorabilia, how, how do we call it later on? So there are ways to engage into the space uh, uh, that are beyond just, just raising funding through the NFTs. So at the end, I could say that we are very excited for the NFT future that is coming. We are not afraid of the current market conditions. You should also not be afraid. Don't sell anything. Don't sell anything in a bear market. Uh, <clears throat> or short things, yes. So anyway, um, we believe that, that you know, the hype that was generated in January, February this year, and then uh, last year that was, you know, the big hype was in September, October, and, and in March, actually, when people sold his work for 69 million, will, will slowly kind of die off. But that is the right time 
to create new models for the NFTs. Because at the end of the day, the whole world will probably be NFTs because actually NFTs represent digital ownership. And we need digital ownership for everything. So don't be scared about the current conditions on the market. Don't be scared about the current conditions in the NFT market. Just be there, experiment, build, engage into the communities. Don't think that you know how these communities behave un until you actually get into these Discord chats, start asking questions, start interacting with the people in the space, and you will learn much more than we know actually today about the NFTs because there are really fantastic people in the space that are all trying to, to make the space better. So um, I would like to thank you uh, for, for this opportunity. And uh, I said that I will leave two minutes for uh, questions. So we have, I think, one or, or two questions that can be held. There is a hand raised there. Do we have uh -huh, a mic? Yeah, the mic is coming. Vitomir, uh, Dragomir. Um, firstly, I want to say you're a great innovator in the space, and we are all very grateful for your work. Yeah, applause, applause, please. I was pondering on a question, and it's basically about interoperability, talking about games and NFTs. How would you imagine that if we had like multiple m m <clears throat> metaverses? and games on the other end, how would they be uh, communicate with, with each other and you can like use the NFTs among the different platforms together, basically in terms of interoperability? Yeah, so <clears throat> that's a valid question. I can tell you what, what we are building and, and what others are using. So if you think about it, it's like a, you know, a digital file that is stored somewhere, right? So you need to take this file and make it usable in your own uh, engine or your own game or, or your own metaverse. Uh, uh, here is important that we reach a point where the standard for the 3D files, for example, is uh, widely accepted and that it works on all the platforms that we need it to work. So it needs to work on iOS, it needs to work on Android, it needs to work on PC, on Mac, you know, like on consoles or whatever. The problem here is that if you upload the, the, the normal, let's say, 3D file, which is GLB, FBX, or something like that, it is just too heavy to be held in a decentralized storage or to be held uh, uh, you know, on, a, on a blockchain. So what we are trying to create is a new 3D standard that will kind of have textures. I mean, it's, it's a technical story. I, I don't want to bother you. But the, the, here, the, the thing is, if we get to a point where it is easy for new builders, new developers, to integrate these NFTs, which are actually 3D files that you can access as a link inside of the NFT into their own games, we can have this inter interoperability. The question here is, are we going to be faster than Facebook, uh, I don't know, HTC, or uh, some other company that is building their own kind of closed down ecosystem, these wall gardens, where they want only their assets, they only want their standards and, and kind of their metaverse to exist and to be dominant in the world. So there is an initiative called Open Metaverse um, that was created, uh, I don't know, I think a year ago, or something like that. And, and they're trying actually to build this, like the infrastructure for an open world, like an, an open internet for all the metaverses. So the NFTs could become this kind of a, a, a glue that glues all of these different projects together. So it could be done, it, it will be done. The question is how fast can we do it and how fast the adoption of new standards uh, uh, can be uh, utilized inside of the games and metaverses. Okay, uh -huh. there's one more question. Three, two more questions. Organizers, do we have time? <clears throat> Hi, Vito. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, how would you actually, um, let's say, if you have a physical object or a piece of art, how would you uh, apply that in this NFT world? How would you, you know? protected and Oof. like make it <laughs> nah. happening that's a that's a valid question i haven't covered that topic it's a, it's a it's a big issue right um and the question here is <clears throat> i'll give you an example with physical art so yes th this is a um 
something that, that is requested, that is needed, and that is like how to register a real-life object as an NFT and then sell this NFT and have a claim on, on, on original object. E easy. First sale, it's, it's kind of easy, right? So you can say, okay, this NFT represents this painting. If you buy this NFT, I'll send you the painting. So the artist can send the painting to a new owner. That's half easy, let's say. It's merch NFTs, you need to claim it, you need to have the, somewhere that, uh, that, that the person can enter its address and you know, like shipment details. So it, there are technical issues. But what is here kind of trouble is uh, the secondary sale, which means that if, if we're gonna use the NFT as it should be used, that means that the NFT can be resold to represent the painting. Then the new owner, actually that's second owner of that NFT, needs a way to claim the original object and to have it kind of verified that this is the original object. So it's not a fake copy of something. So there are technologies right now that can provide kind of tagging of real life objects and allowing, um, you know, like protection in a way. But I don't think that the technology is yet there. It, it also, it's, it's a kind of piece of the puzzle that needs to be solved so that we can have a sticker or we can have, I don't know, um, something glued to the original object that is easily readable and you can confirm it for the next owner. And then it comes down to a point that, you know, I hold a, a, a painting and then I sell the painting, NFT of the painting to someone else and I never send him the, the original painting. So then, Again, you need to, to create this kind of a pipeline uh, that, that will um, legally oblige a previous owner, if he sold the NFT, he needs to send the original object to the new owner, uh, unless you know, like the or new owner gets uh, the, the object, he cannot get the money, or it's an escrow account, and there is also agreements and license things, uh, contracts that can be you know, signed on the blockchain. So there is a... There are problems, so a couple of technical problems and then a couple of real life problems of, of, of shipment and, and, and things like that, if that, yeah. But we are working on it, yes. <laughs> Do you know? Hello? Oh, here. Uh -huh. Hi. Hi. Here. On uh -huh. your right, yeah. Hello. Thank you for a great presentation. Um, this yesterday, was not a presentation, this was a freestyle. Yeah, <laughs> a great freestyle, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yesterday it was mentioned in this same room that uh, in order to achieve uh, mass adoption, uh, 15 to 20 percent of usage should happen to a certain degree in order to, to achieve that. And uh, as you described uh, in your talk, uh, we need a common protocol for those 3D files in order to be uh, used in multiple metaverses or any 3D or virtual worlds. But uh, on the other hand, we have uh, the Facebooks and the Googles that already own the crowd and they are creating stuff uh, within their ecosystems that are used and controlled by them. Are you afraid that their protocols and their standards will be mass adapted much quicker than uh, the whole thing uh, all the other people are trying to create? Another tough question. Um, <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm not afraid. I'm, I'm really not afraid because at the end of a, of a day, you know, like the winners will, will be the ones that, that get users and, and users will be happy. <laughs> <laughs> whatever they use, and th that's important. Uh, I mean, we don't know in which direction civilization will go, you know, how things will develop in the next couple of years. You know that we have a lot of crises happening right now on the planet. So we cannot say, like, w w is go Facebook going to win this kind of metaverse uh, uh, war, or is Google going to come in and, 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 and do something, or Apple? Or s but I can tell you this, they're slow, okay? They're very, very, very slow. They, they built a beautiful hardware. Četiri minuta ima. Četiri minuta. Još dva pitanja ima. Okay. So, um, so they're building a, a great hardware because don't, don't forget, without Facebook that built this Oculus headset that is so cheap, 
we could not have uh, what we had yesterday on, on the panel here in, in the virtual world. So here is a, an interesting thought. It's like the, the, the speed of innovation that is happening in small teams is much bigger than the speed of innovation that is happening in the large corporation. So the large corporation has, you know, uh, usually it's on the stock market. It has some, some goals to reach. It needs to, uh, uh, in a way, satisfy their shareholders. So it's not an easy task for them to change direction, to pivot, to decide to ditch something that they've been building for two years and change it for something else. So where I think that there is a, a big opportunity here is, of course, to be fast. But this is the biggest opportunity is like being small. You know, like building in small teams, uh, going from, from one, uh, uh, let's say, project to another project, talking to them, uh, integrating things together. I think this is something that Facebook cannot do. Facebook cannot come to the conference like this, hold a, you know, a lecture like this, and then tell you, like, hey, come back in the backstage and find me, and let's build a, a, a new game or a metaverse together. They cannot do that. So this is what we can do here, the audience, us, you know, like, and I think that these quick, fast movements will eventually lead to uh, a creation of, 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 I hope, an open metaverse uh, uh, version of, of the world. Gotovo, još jedno pitanje, ajde, šta rekla su četiri minuta. Hello, thank you very much. Um, I have a simple question to finish off. Okay. What do you think is the biggest problem of play to earn games? Simple question, huh? That's very simple. <laughs> um, okay, so play to earn. <clears throat> I think the biggest problem is changing the, changing the, the, the logic of what a game is. Okay, it's not a game. When you, when you make it play to earn, it becomes, you know, your, your job. It's, you're not playing a game, you're earning money. Which is a completely different uh, uh, aspect of, of, of the whole kind of approach to games. So what happened in the previous times is that when you go to a, I mean, uh, uh, that first, when I was a kid, you, you go to a shop to buy a game. You, you buy a box, right? You, you come back home and you play a game. So there is a value exchange where you are paying someone that created this experience for you so that you can enjoy it. Okay, so you're paying for enjoyment or, 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 or um, this, this experience that you're having when you, while you are playing the game. The goal of the creator of the game was to have you enjoy it as much as, as uh, you can. So the, the idea behind the creation of the game was, hey, let's build something that is, that is fun, that is engaging, that is interesting, that is educational while the idea behind the play-to-earn games is, hey, let's make something that you can you know, make money uh, uh, while playing it, which completely changes the approach of a gamer towards a game. And I think this is a big problem, especially if you think about, I mean, it's also a, a, a new avenue to explore, but if you think about these young generations, okay, so what is the, the thing that they're doing, like they're mostly when they're playing games, the only way that they can earn currently money is to become a YouTuber, right? So they, they have a, or, or on, on Twitch, they can, they can hold these kind of live gaming sessions. So they're earning money, but it's not, it's not natural for all of the gamers, right? So some of, of, of kids can do that, like they're, they're not afraid of the public uh, appearance or uh, expression, but others, they would die to be able to earn some money while playing the game. So we still have to kind of explore these avenues. And also the problem in play-to-earn models is that they are created not as a Ponzi schemes, but you know, like it, it, new players need to come in to bring fresh money into the space so that money can be earned by other players. So there still needs to be a way that you know, like utilize the play-to-earn model in a different way so it, it, it makes logic. But, I mean, we will see if that answers your question. 